the things that we often judge ourselves about are not necessarily what we need to be worried about. It's, it's, are we harming other people? Are we adding to their lives in a good way? You know, like that seemed to be a message that came up. I don't know what your overall message seemed to be, but the things we judge ourselves about, like, and I've actually never talked about this in an interview, but I uh, attempted suicide before my near death experience. And so I had this moment where I did this. And when I saw this in my life review, it was as if God was like, don't even worry about it. That was the darkness. That was your mind taking you somewhere you didn't need to go. And it's just not something you need to think about anymore. You need to turn to the light <laughs> in everything. It was turn to the light, turn to the light for healing, turn to the light for your own healing and remind others too. For those who uh, want to know about suicide, I ask about suicide. And we can never judge, I'll just say this, anybody for the choice that they make because we don't know the state of mind that they are in when they make the choice to take their life. So we must forget. We must love them because they don't know. Forgive them for they know not what they do. I kept it to myself for a long time until um, I felt called actually to share it, to support people who are dealing with life. I mean, the big message I got was, wow, this is just a second, really. In the grand scheme, it's just a moment. And that even those who are experiencing the worst of the worst that our planet has to offer people, it comes to an end and it's like it was a dream. And there is complete healing and complete exoneration. And everybody that ever harmed anybody gets to see it from their point of view. And, and there's, a, you know, like a, I don't know, a redemption, if you will, where we all see from each other's perspectives. And when you see from somebody else's point of view, there is nothing but forgiveness, gratitude, love. That's all that's there, so. Oh, and the other, that's right. The other thing I was told was that because it's not my time, there's no cheating. The interpretation is no suicide. You are cheating if you do that. He didn't say it was a sin or a crime. I'm not saying that I know if it is or it isn't because I don't, but he said no cheating. What about that part? You cannot go before it's your time or it's cheating. I don't know why he said that, but he did. So no suicide. And apparently some of us end up doing that. Um, so, and I also read where they're trying to um, educate certain psychiatrists, psychologists to help people like the end of years who seem to have bad depression. They, they come back with depression. And I get that because I had it too. And it's, I don't know why I couldn't, I couldn't function very well at first. I just couldn't do it because I, I know this is a, not a farce, but it's school. It's, I mean, we're all here to learn. We're all here to do better and be better. How you treat others and stuff. Because I ran into someone recently who opened his mouth right there in the hospital and started talking and he did end up in a mental institution for a while because they thought he was crazy. So the life now changed, three years of depression, uh, three attempts at suicide, because I don't want to be here. And after the third attempt, uh, which was kind of very interesting, the voice in my head said, well, A, if you come back, we're going to send you back. So stop trying to get here illegally. And then I said, well, is there a legal way to do this? How can I do this legally? Uh, you know, I know a lot of people have um, a fear of death. I have zero fear of death. Matter of fact, I want to go back. I mean, I can't wait. I'm, I'm, I'm in no hurry. You know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm here to dance. I'm here to play this out to, you know, as long as I can. But uh, uh, one thing I can tell you is that suicide won't work. If you're thinking about that, you can just scratch that one off the list because it's not going to do what you think it's going to do. And I'm not exactly sure what that means. You got, <clears throat> I'm no guru. But I, that was, I know that was one, one of the things that I was shown is that no, you're not gonna, you know, there's no short way around. 
you're not going to die until you fulfill your purpose. Next thing I knew it, off to my right, comes up this beautiful, young, radiant woman. She looked familiar to me, but I thought, how could she be familiar to me? I, I, I don't know who she is. And she said, Catherine. I said, yes. She said, I'm your grandmother, Catherine. And I thought, how could, how could you be so familiar to me? Because she had committed suicide before I was born. She continued to tell me what her life was about and what led up to her suicide and what happened after. And after that, I had gone through my own life review. There's a complete blank from being in that blackness to being in a white room. And it was a beautiful white room, but it was pure white. The walls, the ceiling, the floor were like luminescent, pearlescent, white, white, white. And I was in this room, and I don't remember the transition from the black, to the black, uh, floating in that blackness to the white. And that white room, I was told I was there for healing, that whether I went back or whether I went on, we can't go to heaven with burdens and sadness and sickness. So I thought, okay, well, this is great. I like the white room. <laughs> and being an architectural historian, I looked around for lights, and there were no lights. It was just the walls were illuminated from within. And I saw a door at the other side of the room, and I decided, I don't know if I have feet or legs, but I'm going to perambulate toward that door. And it was almost as though, just with the intention, I started moving toward the door. And I knew where the door was. My whole life I've studied near-death experiences and read the books. And I knew the door meant that there was no coming back, that that was crossing the Rubicon. So I eagerly scooted toward the door at best possible speed because I was done. And I was so, again, just profoundly grateful. And at the door, I paused. Oh, I paused and I asked, is this the divine will for my life? That a simple slip of the surgical knife takes me out. And the answer was no. But the answer also was, but whatever you decide, if you decide to go forward or you decide to go back, whatever decision you make, you go with all of God's grace and mercy and blessings and love. There isn't a wrong decision. And that was immensely comforting because two and a half years prior to this event, my husband had come home for lunch one day and ended his life at our home. And I had been suffering from so many pains from that experience. Suicide survivors have burdens that most people can't imagine. But there have been so many difficult decisions to make, and one of my daily prayers was, God, I can't make any more decisions. These decisions all hurt so much and are so tough and all have such enormous consequences. So I felt like God had heard my prayers and saying, okay, you're not, you don't have to make a tough decision. There's, there's not a wrong decision here. And that meant the world to me. And my other daily prayer had been, Either let me die in my sleep or heal me. But the pain occasioned by my husband's horrific suicide had cost me more grief and agony and suffering than I could ever enumerate with words. So I felt like those prayers had been answered too, that I had passed in relative peace and it was over. And my other prayer had been that I would not have a life review. Having gone through this once, I did not want to experience it again. And I did not have a life review. And I, it, it, it opened my eyes to how prayers of petition are also powerful, powerful prayers. Uh, he was going to show me an access from one life to another life to another life. Every mirror, every image was a life, a life, a life, a life. I could have seen a whole string, a whole, what we call now, what I know now, a whole superposition of images, of lives I had at access. And I would have had to absorb all the good and all the bad from each one of those other lives. And I said, I understand now what I must do. So then I realized that what we call sin or negativity is, is, can be compared to gravity. So when we do something bad or something wrong, we acquire gravity. So in this state of heaven, everything moved. Within that light, everything ascended, everything moved. Nothing was static, nothing was stationary. Everything moved. And here it is, when I landed, 
in this heavenly plane, I realized when I first got there is if, again, I'm, I'm blind, I don't see, I feel. Everything, again, is with, a, with the exception of the lights. Everything is pure, pure darkness. But within that darkness is infinite love and infinite ecstasy. So we're going back in infinite understanding. But I also knew within that light, within that plane, everything was ascending. And for me to stay in that heavenly plane, I would have to shed the guilt. I would have to shed the negativity. I would have to shed the sins that I acquired in this life and those other lives. So it was a purification process to be able to keep ascending in this light of these high beings. So uh, when I realized that, I realized it was not my time to go. And I, um, I remembered that I had sinned, I, had, I was negative, I was not perfect. I was not perfect enough to stay in this heavenly plane. And as my ego and it acquired that realization, they both in that realm acquired gravity and I descended and descended and descended back into the earth and vibrated back into the body. And I said, wow. And I realized that if anyone has, I'm not suicidal, at, period, at all. But I realized in this space, in this plane, here, the earth, the people, when they commit suicide, they go up, they experience that transcendental, infinite love and ecstasy. And the problem with that is when they go, they come right out of it. People who are not really good people on this earth, when they do bad things like Hitler and, and other people, they go into light. They go, they sin, but guess what? They come right out of it real fast because of the guilt. The guilt, again, the sin, the negativity, produces gravity. A purified person has no, has zero gravity, and they ascend, they stay. So with that realization, um, I realized that um, um, a lot of people who are negative, why they go in and come out, they reincarnate back. At this particular time in my life, I was um, sleeping in my car. I had a wife who had left with my two-year-old daughter. There was no money left. The circumstances I'm not going to go into, but I had got an inheritance and it was gone. The taxes were not paid on the inheritance like I thought they were. There was a loan even on the car I had that I had not signed for, but nonetheless was made. I was working full time, but I had no money. I lost 60 pounds in less than three months. I was coming back, and this is Los Angeles. And for those back in 1984, remember, they didn't have those things in some front of the pillars, the cushion things they do today. So I looked and said, I'm going to drive into this large pillar here. About 70 miles an hour, I won't feel anything. As much as I tried to turn the wheel for whatever reason, you can call it intervention or just my own, I could not turn the wheel left. So I got off at my normal exit and came off the off ramp, came down at light, and I put my head on the wheel. And if you remember, and I'm nearly everybody, those vests they put on you when you have a dental exam x-ray. Imagine laying down and putting about a thousand of those on top of you. And as I explained to other people, I felt lower than a snake's belly button. There is broad daylight, but it's like a black room. I had no family. There's no one I could turn to at that time. And all that blackness. All of a sudden, my car lit up like a flashbulb in a dark room. And I went from absolute despair to absolute joy. I was crying. I was yelling out. I said, then, God, God, we're going to make it. We're going to make it. I had no idea how. I still slept in my car that night. And I still drank warm water to keep my stomach from growling so I could sleep. But it changed that quick. I calmed myself down because otherwise I was going to tear the steering wheel off my car. And I turned on the radio to help calm me down. There was a song, and you can find it if you want, but it's from a guy named Barry Manlow. And this song had been out, but I didn't know about it until that day. And I said, I'm, 
I made it through the rain. I kept my perspective. I made it through the rain. I kept my point of view. I made it through the rain and was respected by those who made it through the rain too. Now, if you told me that in 1984, I'd be a licensed clinical social worker at 20 years experience, I'm also an ordained minister, I would say, I don't know what you're drinking or smoking, but it's got to be good. But I learned a lesson that day that I share with my clients. If you hold on, hold on, you'll get through it. You're not forgotten. If you hold on one more day, just count one more day, you'll get through it. Now, I had no family, and maybe that's why the divine or God checked off a little light to change me. But the divine can work through a family member, a spouse, a child, a parent, can work through a friend. But if there's somebody who says to you, hold on, listen to them, hold on, I'm not special. The div divine to me loves me just as much as they love you. There's nothing special that says, oh, me, this person, no. It chucked off because I had no one to, to turn to, but uses other people around you. One more day, give it one more day, and it starts to unfold. And all your troubles, all these issues start to fade, and you move forward. And when you take it from a guy who was sleeping in his car, almost dumpster dived, and you know what I'm talking about, lost 60 pounds in three months, to a guy who now is recording this as an ordained minister and licensed clinical social worker who lives in a comfortable home and has a fairly decent life. Wow. So I encourage you, don't ever think for a moment that this is it, there is no more. Hold out, it changes. It changes, and I will only ask you, how many of you still have the hairline, the waistline, or exact same friends, or exact same wage you had from high school? Especially the wage, I hope you make more. Exactly, it changes, and so will the stuff around you. Hang in there, and you too will make it through the rain. You too will be respected by those who make you through the rain too. Now I met who is my husband today, and he was with the Navy. He said, you have to come to the United States. Things are getting really hard there. You're going to get killed. But it was hard to leave this job because in Colombia, only 4% of the budget goes to science. And for me to get this job and this good position, I was the chief of the Marine Biology and Ecology Department. I had a really good job. So it was like, I cannot leave this. I mean, I got this job opportunity, how I can leave this job. But there's a moment in your life that you reach this point that none of this worth anything. When your life, it's a peril. When now you realize that your happiness is gone. We came to the United States and only like three days after we married, somebody got hurt, they needed him to travel. He left for seven months and left me alone. <laughs> United States and didn't know anybody's when I realized I'm lost in this world. And I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. So like, it's like one challenge followed the other. And after that, uh, he was a special forces in the Navy and he kept traveling. And although I kept meeting other dreams that were incredible, I, I got the opportunity to do my PhD to work with NASA, I had my baby. At the same time, it was facing the fact that I was alone. My husband spent all his time traveling. My family was not in the US. I had to raise this child alone. He was really sick baby when, when he was little. I had heart problems. So like one thing followed another, another. So I reached the point where I, I just was thinking why all this is happening in my life. 
it's been one harsh you follow the other. And I even felt it since I was little because I couldn't understand when I was young why I, I came with all this awareness, why I was different, and now it was all these challenges. And one night I went to bed and I was just thinking, I had it, I had enough. The only thing keeping me alive at that moment of my life was my, my little baby. He was the light of my life at that moment and he was the one keeping me here. One night I was lying there next to my, my little one and, and this is things that brought me to feel so much empathy for the people that suffers because Sometimes people commit horrendous crimes, but we don't understand why, and we're just really quick to criticize or to judge. But I remember lying next to him and thinking, I love him so much that I cannot leave this world without him. And when I looked at him next to him, just lying next to me, I thought, what if, what, what if, what if I take him with me? So it was a second of thinking something so horrible that I just at that moment I thought what am I thinking I lost it now I was lost and it's when I went back to pray again I went back to the complete and absolute desire to be connected with the light again I need some light and I pray like I had never prayed. I had to stop praying and meditating because I had made so many mistakes that I thought I wasn't worth it of the being so light. And, and it was amazing because once this, I prayed, the answers came immediately. So when I realized no one is judging me, I'm the only one judging myself. There's a point in your life that life shakes you so hard that you only have two choices. There's only two paths. The path of suffering or the path of the light? The path of suffering is, is like a cul-de-sac. You go to the end of this and there's nowhere to go. Or it's like when you're in a car and you turn it on, you press the gas, but you never put the drive, put the car in drive, you don't go anywhere. You're spending all your gas. You're spending all your energy. You're circling there. Nothing is happening until you realize I had enough of this. Some people have to get sick, somebody has to die. You, you feel that you're going to just kill yourself. Whatever it is, it brings you and shakes you so hard that you are forced to stop. And it's when you ask the question, what is this for? What am I doing here? The, now the important questions start coming. And it's when the answers also start appearing. It's when you say, at that point when sometimes I, I am just so trapped in things I don't understand, I said, God help me see because I cannot see. But I know that behind this challenge there is a teaching, there is a purpose. And the very next day I got, I woke up with the answer I needed. And I said to people, sometimes it are the most simple answers. The answer was, yeah, you need help, go look for a psychologist. Yeah, and I had it clear. It was not just as, oh, I may do it. No, it was clear. I went this morning to my office. I looked for a psychologist. I phoned a guy in the web, and it was the right person. So I went to talk to him, and it's when we realized that sometimes what we truly need is just to be listened. And this person was opening to listen. This guy is not judging me. And that was the opening for me. I was the one that said to him, why me again? This question that always was resurfing, resurfing and like, why me? Why this is happening to me? And it's when I got the most amazing answer. And he said, why not? For me, this was like the switch I needed at that moment. The light I turned off was on now. Because at that moment, he started to also say, look, thanks to this, you have done this. Thanks to this, you have done that. Thanks to this and this. And, and I was able to connect all the knots. And now it's like all my neurons, everything was like accelerating and everything was connecting. And this was the first time in my life I put myself at the cause of everything 
and not at the effect. And I started to see purpose in absolutely everything. At that moment, I also realized that none of that had happened was here anymore. It was in my mind and I could decide what to do with it. Wow, I can grab all this and just make a decision to start fresh. The true feelings of, of, of sense of forgiveness happen. It was the realization that there was nothing to forgive because nothing had ever been done to me to hurt me. It's been done for me to bring me to wake up. So this was one of my very first big awakenings. Now I was in the absolute knowing that source or the creator or God or ultimate reality, however we want to call it, was the essence of absolutely everything. Everything was it. Is suicide a choice that's been made before one's born? The question is, is suicide a choice made, made before one's born? Your... I believe that it's certainly entered as a possibility, either for the, mostly for the loved ones, and sometimes for the person. All right. um, oh gosh, that opens a whole big doorway. I want to tell you about quickly about something that happened in Nanaimo, um, doing a lecture there uh, about a year and a half ago. And I went to Nanaimo earlier and had a bite to eat because the lecture starts at 7 o'clock. And um, while I'm sitting in the restaurant, you know, waiting for my dinner before I'm going to head over there, this has never happened before. I'm sitting there and I started getting feeling the pressure in my sinuses. And I was like, oh crap, I'm getting a cold, I'm getting a headache. And pretty soon this pressure built up and it started going <laughs> in my ears. And I thought, oh, geez, now I'm having a stroke. This is great. Because <laughs> I've had a couple of heart attacks. <laughs> and this was just like, you know, the sound that when you're driving down the highway at 60 miles an hour, you open your back windows in your car and it goes. <laughs> That's what it was doing in my head and my ears. And I was thinking, and pretty soon I could hear a voice, or it seemed like a voice, somebody talking to me. And pretty soon I began to see images in my mind of a child being abused. And what is this? I, mean, I am having a stroke. And this voice trying to say something to me, and then I see images of suicide. And I thought, what the hell is this? And I couldn't figure this out until this voice, finally, this guy's yelling, guy's voice, and he said, you've got to talk about the suicide. I'm thinking, what? What? what that? And then it dawned on me, oh, somebody's going to be there tonight at this talk that he wants to get a hold of. And I said, I'm not John Edwards, get out of my head. <laughs> Because I don't know that I trust that. Or James Van Prager, or those people who do that. And so, I, you know, the meal came and I went on and then my headache subsided and I, and I did this chat much like this. And it was the most confusing thing I've, that I've done. Because about every 10 minutes or so, this guy would be talking in my head. And I'd be talking and, and sort of, where was I? You know, I'd be losing this thing, right? So during the question period, finally, somebody stood up and they said, do you see ghosts? And right then, this guy said, he just yelled, he said, no! And I'm just like, oh, Jesus. I said, no, I don't normally see them, if, if it, unless I'm in an altered state, but I sure just hear them. <laughs> And I just and I explained what happened at lunch or at, at, at dinner, and I said, "So I got it. He wants I, this. This is for somebody here to hear this. He wants me to talk about this." And I couldn't in my mind. I couldn't decide. Now, did this guy was he abused as a child and then committed suicide, or did he abuse somebody and commit suicide? 
And so I started talking about suicide, and I told them about the priest, and, and the notions that we get punished for it, and it's all not true. And there was a, a number of people crying in the audience. And this guy was explaining to me about that he needed me to explain that this is about part of the way this was supposed to evolve and that this person, whoever it was, needs to get her life back in order. And I didn't know who it was, but afterwards a woman came up to me in tears and she says, that was for me. And that was her boyfriend, or her common-law. And she found out that he had abused her daughter. But it weighed heavily on him, the whole thing. And she walked in the room just as he shot his brains out. So for three years, <clears throat> excuse me. For three years her life stood still. She couldn't function. She couldn't work. She was on welfare. Um, her relationship with her daughter had gone to hell. And he's saying, I'm sorry. But you've got to understand this was part of our agreement. And you need to put your life back together. <clears throat> well, about six months later, I ran into someone who was this lady's friend. And she said, the change is remarkable. She's back at work. Her life is more productive. She's dealing with stuff. That's how spirit motivates us. That's how it gets back to us. Right. So, I know I've used up so much time, and I just wanted to get that message to you. It's about love. Now I have the knowledge my family doesn't love me. I thought I have a choice now. I could go up to the house, that family that doesn't love me, or I could go back to the pond. And I know it'll be scary, but I won't find it this time. So at five years old, I didn't know the word suicide, but I felt I had a choice. I felt I had a right since I had this knowledge and since I seen two different ways of living. And just as I made decision, yeah, I'm gonna do that, I started to walk towards the pond and the angel, the female voice that I heard before, I now see her and she's in the shape of a white light of a young, thin woman. And she's hovering over the road and she says, no, don't. And I see her. And I said, well, why not? You know they don't love me. And she says, well, you'll have a lot of love someday. And I said, where will I find it? And she pointed her hand, her finger towards Belpre, and then she was gone. And some strange things happen after the drowning that, of course, I pushed away too. Uh, I didn't understand them. And then after the second NDE, these would come back in very strong flashbacks. Not long after the drowning, we went to Vito Lake, which is just a few miles up our road, to go fishing as a family. And everybody got their fishing poles, getting ready to fish. And I thought, well, I'm bored with fishing. I knew more about fish now than I cared to because of the drowning, I guess. I felt led to just wander off. I felt there was something I was supposed to find or it was a curiosity. I just started wandering off towards the woods and I heard my mom yell for my brother John and she whispered with her hand cut so my dad couldn't hear. She said, go with her. And so John ca caught up with me. And then my sister Terry, seeing that my brother John was with me and she always liked to have him with her. And so she ran over and she said, what's going on? He said, well, she always gets me in trouble. It's not my fault that she drowned. I remember so clearly walking around and feeling I'm supposed to find something. Something's here. And I stood there in the middle of this ugly place in the woods. And then I saw a wildflower growing out from underneath the rock in this dry cracked mud. And I go over and I sit down and I'm looking at it. And I'm growing compassion for it and interest in it. 
I'm thinking, how did you grow here? You know, it was such a beautiful flower. And how did you grow from out under this rock? And there's no other life here. And then I had a spiritual experience that something communicated to me through this flower because I was given information as I'm sitting there looking at the flower. This flower is like me. I am going to have a very hard time growing up. But because of it, I will have a strength inside of me that other girls will never know. What about those who commit suicide? What's there? What's the common occurrence for that? The common occurrence for that is they don't easily transition back into unconditional love because they have a lot of guilt with them. That's true of people who commit suicide because they are in the overwhelm situation. Mm. They just can't deal with life. If they're committing suicide because it's a contract that they did with their family and associates to let the family and associates have some type of an experience, then they generally go immediately into the light. Mm. And, and when, you, when I say I asked, you don't talk like you're speaking, like I'm talking to you right now. You speak in a way of what I believe that we call telepathy. You know what the other person is saying, and, and you converse that way. And I asked them, I said, what is going on over here? And he told me, that's an angel uh, speaking with that man, trying to get him to stay here with us where we're at. And there was nothing more said about it, but in my heart I felt like that man had committed suicide and that angel was trying to get him to stay here with us. I, I can't say I understand the whole meaning of that, but, but that's what I felt was was the situation um i i know i've heard um, other people talk about a tunnel but for me i i mostly remember coming just coming through this open portal and um as soon as i came in it the situation to me felt very normal kind of like if i just walked in this room and people were just walking in through the doors and it didn't i didn't have a reason to Oh my gosh, you know, am I dead? And in fact, I don't know why I didn't think of that. Um, I think I've, I've said to people that it felt so normal there. I didn't really have a lot of clues around to tell me, you know, you, you could be dead, but I didn't, that's not, you know, the fact that I might be dead didn't come to my mind. And I was also just kind of interested watching people come in and everyone was just dressed like how, you know, normal people dress and, um, and one of the things that started happening right away, um, and I don't know why I wasn't weirded out, I didn't have a lot of the whole fright thing. Like in life, I tend to be kind of a nervous person or sensitive, and I question, you know, that was my past, how I was. But for some reason in this space, I felt kind of calm. Um, so one of the things that happened was that people were, you could communicate and understand each other. Like if someone gave the intention to, say something it it just flowed and i could understand right away what people were communicating without the way we hear things here when we talk to each other um, so um, people have said this is called a telepathic and this is this kind of what it felt like but it didn't seem weird to me it seemed probably more normal than when we talk this feels more heavy and like we're in a struggle compared to what i experienced there um, so that was going on. Um, I, in this situation, I was just noticing different people, and I there was um, a man who I, for some reason, felt that he was like a mentor or a teacher from from how I sensed him, and I ended up going over to him at one point and kind of um, asking him what, you know, what is he here for? Like trying to figure out who who is he. And my understanding was that he was kind of like a mentor and um, part of what he had mastered in his life was humility. And I hesitated even to share that with people because I bring up the word humility 
from how I understood it there, and it doesn't necessarily transfer to how we see it here because humility there, there's, I don't know, before I might have thought like this bowing or I'm meek and small, and but there it wasn't, the humility was just, there was a confidence. In fact, there was more confidence in this calmness and honesty and pureness. And um, he had that, and when he was in this space with these people that were there, it was almost as if he was like a tuning fork of what that what humility embodied for these people that are here. And um, he was he was telling me that when he's here, in a way, it's as if he's teaching. But I never saw him teach, so I'm not sure that I can say that he had taught like you know getting in front of people. But um, he was helping them to to get past themselves um, so that they could see in a different way. And one of the things I understood about this space that I went into was that um, these people that were there, I here I would use the word suicide, but their suicide um, is seen a little differently than how I had understood it before. And one of the things I understood from there was that, um, at least in the place I was in, was that a lot of these people that were coming in, they had ended their own lives even if they didn't mean to necessarily get to that place, that's they, in one way or another, took themselves to their deaths. Um, and for example, there were a number of boys that came in together and I knew right away they had been in a car wreck and that they had been <coughs> drinking. And so it's kind of like, you're, that's taking a risk and so it's sort of suicidal risk, you know, kind of thing. There are a number of different situations, but, um, uh, so he was here to help those people. It's a really good question and I've never had depression. I'm very lucky. I've always suffered from anxiety but then since I had my experience, my anxiety massively reduced because I just didn't stress about life so much. But depression, you know, is causes suicide and to, to get to that point, it crosses over. And you know, in the paediatric world, this year we've had eight attempted suicides for adolescents. So we've never seen anything like this ever. But I think people that have depression, you know, this is a disease where people are living in the past, whereas anxiety is a, is a modern disease where you're living in the future, whereas you can just live in the now. That can really help with those feelings. Because we're all here to learn lessons. But for somebody who's grappling with depression and, you know, they want to end their life, I totally understand what you're saying. You can, you know, why do they not want to get to this amazing place um, and have that? But I, you know, I absolutely wouldn't recommend it. I think if we can just take life less seriously and if, if there's certain things in life that are making you depressed and you can change it. Of course, if you've got five children, a single parent and you've got no money, life can be horrendous. But if you are in a position to change your job, to change where you live, then do it because that could change what that depression is. But then, you know, depression might be a chemical issue. There's some fantastic work going on at Imperial University at the moment where they're looking at psilocybin. So these people that had chronic depression and they're suicidal, they've been signed up for this new drug that changes their whole outlook on their life. So I think this psilocybin is going to be a really exciting new drug that might be able to help people see the greater picture. I'm not sure if you've heard about psilocybin. It's the, it's the component of magic mushrooms, but they're now using it in medical treatment for depression and people that have addiction issues. So Imperial University are pioneering the way for this at the moment. And going into some of these life lessons that I've now lived by because of this experience. One is my intentions. I think if we were all much more aware of our intentions and the power of our actual thoughts, we would be much more careful about what we did with our, our thinking. And I totally believe in like what we sow is what we reap. So if you can think positively and give out positive energy, that does come back and it is a really important part of our lives. So but just to be aware of your intentions, what your true intention is, and then trying to be non-judgment is another life lesson that I'm trying to lead on from this, which is easier for me to do because of the connectedness that I had. Trying to see why people are behaving in a, in a particular way, to think about what actually happened to them or to their parents for them to be a particular way. And just to be kind, often people have these near-death experiences and they think they have to have this life-changing career where they go into Reiki medicine or they go into healing, which is fantastic. But I think all you really need to do is to be kind. 
there's this great quote, you know, in a world where you can be anything, just be kind. All you have to do every day is be kind. And that's what I just find now with the job. But even coming back, I didn't have this great message saying that you your job's not done yet. You have to do what you need to do. I really just feel that you just, you know, smiling to somebody on the street or if someone smiles to you, it can make a huge impact on your day. And knowing that life is just a game and we are here just to experience as many human emotions as possible, good and bad, so we can grow emotionally and our souls can grow. I take much more risk, like not physical risks, but I take those big risks in career or in life or going on holidays and doing these really fun stuff because it's worth taking the risk. What's the worst that can happen? So if you've got the option to apply for a job, to ask somebody out on a date, just do it because life is just a game and just to enjoy it as much as you can. And if you can be grateful, have a gratitude diary because I was ill coming back from a holiday a couple of weeks ago and it wasn't then till I was really ill that I realised how important it is just having your health and having the physical health to go out and get into nature. So nature for me and where I live in the countryside now, it's a way that I connect to that higher level very quickly. And we all have a very busy mind and by shutting down that mind, going to what I call walking meditation and I get out as much as I can. So I think that's quite a nice bit for me for take home message is that walking meditation to shut the brain down, which is so hard for people to do because often it's very negative narrative that goes on in people's minds and to close that down. It's a real skill. And I can connect very quickly by listening just to the birds, to the leaves in the tree, and I get to that higher, higher consciousness where I can connect again to that beautiful source of energy and then just not taking life seriously at, at all. So these are the, the lessons that I really try to, to live by as much as I can.